Hey, good evening, everyone. Um, it's good to see you uh, as we continue our study of uh, Isaiah. Uh, we're going to pray, and as we pray, it's good to lay on the Lord things that are on our mind. It says in 1 Peter, uh, casting all our cares upon him, for he cares for us. And uh, I have a when you have children, you have cares. You just do. <laughs> and uh, my uh, youngest daughter, who I pray for an awful lot, um, she uh, lost her wallet today. Um, and quite honestly, everything's replaceable. Um, what concerns me most about her is that she's in the turbulence of the secular college institution, which raises questions about everything she believes and uh, um, and so, I mean, happily, we have a good relationship. The conversation is open, but it reminds me that we always need to pray for our kids, and knowing that they are in different journeys and different pressures that they're going through at different stages of life. And we want them to find the truth. We want them to discover the truth. Uh, today, uh, at staff meeting, I surprised everyone because I said, uh, let's everyone give Pastor Henry, our testimony, because I think the new pastor should know what our faith story is. What was interesting to see is how many faith stories really revolved around age 19 to 24 in that age bracket, um, from Pastor Jerry to uh, Leslie. Leslie went to a Christian college, and in freshman year, she was wondering, does she believe all this? Because is, is everyone just cultural Christians and uh, you know just one person after another told their story of how things formed in them and I take comfort that it wasn't this smooth sailing from childhood to adulthood that there are the ups and downs you know in our faith journey and so we're here in part to solidify our faith by reading the scriptures and holding to the scriptures and and learning from the scriptures. But as we do, we do with an umbrella over our children, over our families, and hoping and praying that the Lord's provision and blessing and guidance would be upon them also. And so let's pray. And as I pray for my family, you pray for yours. And we cast all our cares upon the Lord, for he cares for us. Gracious Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. And we take great joy that we get to come to the Word, your Word, the book of Isaiah, and discover a little bit more of your heart. But in the process, we recognize coming to a place where we believe the Bible is your Word doesn't happen automatically. And Lord, in this world, there are many sirens drawing us to all different thoughts and ideas some of them healthy, some of them not so healthy. And so, Father, first of all, I pray for our kids, our families, our spouses, and I ask you to keep them in a safe place. And Lord, if they've wandered, if they've gone to a place that perhaps is unhealthy or unwise, we know that your spirit is strong and drives people to the right place. Father, even as Pastor Frank gave his testimony of being drawn into the Jehovah Witnesses, but in time, in his case five years, it just didn't smell right. And you opened his eyes through seeing Billy Graham on TV and having a friend that related to him at work that drew him and invited him to the Brooklyn Tabernacle. Just like you reached into his life just like you reached into my life and our lives in this room we ask that you would preserve and protect those who we love and draw them to yourself and we pray that our lives might be a living witness before them and i pray father that our time tonight might contribute not just to a head knowledge experience but to a heartfelt experience that answers the question why i am a christian why i choose to follow this God. Thank you, Father, for our opportunity to be led by your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Yes, sir. Can you say her name? Uh, my daughter's name? Tabitha. We have in April, we had that problem. With oh, okay. Yeah, well, you know, I will probably be praying for my kids till the day I die. Mm -hmm. I was watching a favorite TV show I enjoy, uh, Last Man Standing. And Tim Allen makes the point, he says, there I'll be 85 years old, and my last breath will be, did my daughter check the air in her tires? <laughs> and then he'll die. <laughs> because we are concerned about our children. Um, and uh, as I said, I'm fresh off a series of text messages with my daughter about her lost wallet. But I'm far more concerned about anything she might lose in the heart and uh, that's what you know matters most. I don't think Tabitha's watching, but if you are, love you, honey. <laughs> All right, let's uh, dig into our quiz. And uh, I wasn't in like a funny mo mood when I wrote this, so it's it, I don't really have any funny ha ha questions here. Just nuts and bolts of the passage. And truth be told, if you took this quiz and were not taking this class. You'd be like, you're insane. How would anybody know these questions? Um, but, uh, but you guys have taken the class, or at least of most of it. So let's give it a try. Number one, in the prophecy against Moab, based on the towns, the movement is north to south, east to west, south to north, west to east. Does anyone remember? North to south. North to south. It is A, north to south. Let me show you the picture here. The names of the towns that are mentioned go from up here. This is the, the Dead Sea or Salt Sea, it says. Jerusalem is over here. There's Jericho. And the towns are coming down. What the sense is, is that this is an invading force, probably the Assyrians, that are coming in and moving and sweeping like locusts over Moab. And so the movement is north to south. Okay, next one. Number two. In the oracles against Babylon, Assyria, Philistines, and Moab, only one moved Isaiah. In other words, you actually heard his passion, his pathos. Which one? Babylon, Assyria, Philistines, Moab. It's Moab. Excellent. See, you guys are good. At least the ones who are speaking up. <laughs> the others who are hanging their head a little low, you know, like, I don't remember that. But yeah, that was a, a, a it's just kind of a touching passage. Um, and if I uh, draw my attention to where that is, oh, it's uh, verse 5 of chapter 15. Isaiah says, my heart cries out over Moab. And this is Isaiah writing this. So he feels for that. We're going to talk about that a little bit more tonight because that's important. Number three. The morning star is left untranslated in the King James and reads, A, Satan, B, Lucifer, C, the devil, D, Beelzebub. It is B, Lucifer. It's the only time that word shows up in the Bible. And because for many years that passage was viewed as a description of Satan, that became a word, uh, Satan's first name, Lucifer. Um, and in our culture, it clearly means that. But it actually means morning star. Who is also called the bright and morning star in our Bibles? Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> this is why it's unlikely that this is uh, his name, Satan's name. Okay, number four. Ophir is known for its gold and may be located A, in Greece, B, in India, C, in China, D, in Babylon. B. Gus? B. It is B, because he looked it up, and what province did it suggest that it might be? One where Ash is from. One where Ash is from. That's why she's dripping in gold right now. And, and Valentine's Day at their house is a tough holiday for Gus because he's got to work half the year just to keep her in the gold that she's grown accustomed to. Now, seriously, while we were having this class and I made reference to this, Gus was looking it up on Wikipedia and it actually mentions 
Um, what's the name of the Caroline? Carolyn. Carolyn. How do you say it? Kerala. Kerala. Yes. Um, anyway, it mentions that province, which is in it's southern South. India, isn't it? Yes. Um, near the water. Yeah. But that, it actually mentions that province as the possibility of where this gold came from, which is intriguing that they actually had trade routes that extended that far into India. And that word shows up, in this case, it shows up at a judgment oracle, but it actually shows up when the building of the Solomon's Temple, and it shows up that Jehoshaphat tried to get gold from there, but he failed. He did not succeed. So, that's number four. Number five. Who, surprisingly, gloats over the fall of Babylon? A. Eh? The cedars of Lebanon. B. Israel. C. Assyria. D. Spirits of the departed. A. And the answer is A. The cedars of Lebanon. And D. The spirits of the departed. They kind of greet them when they come. The, they, the king comes down to the Sheol, the, the place of the dead. And they're like, oh, how do you end up here? You know, they start taunting him and... Um, uh, mocking him so it is I'm glad you got the cedars of Lebanon good for you but it's also D spirits of the departed if you remember that set of oracles had different sections and the second section was the underworld and that's what that was referring to number six which king eventually lets Israel return to their land Nebuchadnezzar, Tiglath Pilser, Cyrus, Belshazzar. <laughs> it is Cyrus, C. Now, Nebuchadnezzar precedes him. He's a Babylonian. Tiglath Pilser, does anyone know his heritage? He's a Syrian. And Syrians did not let anyone go. <laughs> um, Belshazzar. He is the last of the Babylonian kings before the Medes and the Persians took over. He is the one who had the handwriting on the wall, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Parson. Um, so he didn't do it. But Cyrus, when he comes to power, he is the one who releases them. Okay. Mount Zaphon. Well, I guess this is my most humorous question. It's not funny, but it's my most lighthearted question. Mount Zaphon is a nice place to make a home if you're a... a God, B, a jackal, C, a king, D, a leper. It is A, a god. It is supposedly, it's their Acropolis, uh, not Acropolis, Olympus. Um, Mount Olympus, thank you. It is their Mount Olympus um, for the Philistines, and their gods were supposed to be up there. And uh, so it's a good place if you are a god. Number eight. What should be your answer to the envoys? These are envoys from the Philistines. Offering help. A, please help us. B, how much money do you need? C, what is your deal? D, I'm sorry, the Lord is our refuge. It is D. By the way, if you fall asleep because I'm boring tonight, that's your primary point to remember <laughs> because that's an important point. The Lord is my refuge. Amen. What shall I fear? I mean, that is, that is all through the scripture. So take that one to the bank. Finally, number nine, King Ahaz dies in the year 738, 715, 701, 684. It is 715 BC. However, while we're here, let's mention some dates. So, 738. Is the year that the uh, exiles return. 701, um, you know what, 738, scratch that. That is definitely a wrong date, and I'm blanking on what that date is. 
So I'm trying to show my knowledge and I'm showing my stupidity right now. I can't even remember though at 738. It's actually a date. There's something important that happened on 738. It's just eluding me right now. 701 is a date we will deal with soon, but that is when Sennacherib, the Assyrian king, comes to attack Jerusalem and it becomes a, a big victory. And 684 is a totally made up date that I threw in there. So it's unimportant from your perspectives. But because 738 is now irking me, oh, I know what it was. Here was the problem. It's 538, and I just wrote 738, and the number 38 was stuck in my head. It's a Five, 538, <laughs> yeah, that's right. 538 is the day the exiles return from Babylon because of Cyrus's decree. But when I saw the 738, it just connected my mind with the 538. So now we know. So ignore 738 in terms of its importance. 701 is important. 715 is important. Okay. That being said, anyone get 9 out of 9? Good for you, Jim. There you go. Anyone else? Asha, you're smiling. Okay. You just had this bright smile. So tonight, I actually spent some time in prayer uh, before tonight's talk is because the last week's passage, it's kind of difficult stuff, meaning there's not like a, a little happy section, you know, that I can bang the drum and, you know, it was difficult, difficult oracles. Well, tonight is a similar place. It, they're not easy oracles, but I know there's gold here. Why do I know that? Because God preserved this scripture for us to read and to learn from. And so I said to the Lord, Lord, bring up some of this gold that I, that I can see it. And as much as six minutes before this class was beginning, I was in Pastor Henry's office going through another commentary because he has some commentaries I don't have. And just looking at them and observing them as to see what we could uh, observe. And so why I want, what I want to do in relation to that, a lot of time is spent on this passage relating to Moab. So if you recall, um, we talked about Moab last time. There were these series of oracles, and that was one of the questions. One concerned Babylon, and first the people of Babylon, then the king of Babylon. There was a brief one on Assyria. There was a brief one on the Philistines, and there was a fairly long one on Moab, which is going to continue tonight. So a lot of time is spent. So it is important to recognize a, a couple things. Uh, the first is this. So in other words, what I'm trying to do right now is give you uh, an idea of why this is here. When we got to chapter 13, what we were seeing is that this is God's judgment in Isaiah against all the nations, all the nations. And there is a strategic reason for this. So here is a map, and I just want to give you a, kind of a lowdown, because this helps us understand why this whole section is in the Bible, from chapter 13 to around chapter 23. Here is Jerusalem, and so this area here, it says the kingdom of Judah, this little dotted line, breaks the difference between the kingdom of Judah and northern Israel. Now, northern Israel doesn't have one righteous king. None. But Judah does have some good righteous kings um, after they split. Just to give us a, a time frame, who's the first king in Israel? Saul. 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 Second king? David. 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 They're, they're actually these little squabbles of like kings for like two weeks. But it's generally Saul, David, then after David, Solomon. Solomon. Solomon has a son. His name is Rehoboam. Rehoboam comes up with this great taxing policy. Sounds a little bit like Elizabeth Warren is suggesting. <laughs> Tax everyone. <laughs> you know, as much as you can. I shouldn't say that. That sounds partisan. I take that back. But she is proposing a lot of tax. <laughs> That's all I have to say. Um, but anyway, the, he, what happens, because of that, the kingdom splits. Southern kingdom, northern kingdom. Now, 
we move forward in time, who is the king we've been dealing with? Ahaz died to 715. We already got that. But Ahaz is king here, Jerusalem. And this question is for Israel, excuse me, for Judah. Who are you going to follow? So you can try to make a deal with the kingdom of Aram. And there's the capital, Damascus, up there, which would be modern day what country? Syria. Syria. So ISIS and all that stuff, that is up there. Or one could try to make a deal with the kingdom of Amman. Or one can try to make a deal with the kingdom of Moab. Or one could try to make a deal with the kingdom of Edom. If we kept going this way, what kingdom would be over here? Egypt. Egypt, excellent. Try to make a deal maybe with the Philistines. Or with the Assyrians up here. So, hmm... What shall I do? And so what Isaiah is doing by saying, I, I know where your mind is going. I know what you're thinking, Ahaz. Can I tell you a glimpse into the future of each of these places? And it's not going to turn out too good for them. So he starts with Babylon. He goes to Assyria. He goes to the Philistines. He goes to Moab. And he gives these oracles from God which all come to one simple point, and it's a powerful point. Choose the Lord. Don't try to find your hope in all these things. You know, my father passed. He's a child of the Depression, and he was born in 1926, so he was a kid in the Depression. What was your fear about putting money in a bank back then? The bank may close with your money in it. The doors are closed, the bank shut down, and there's no money. So what do people who grew up in the Depression frequently do? They have lots of bank accounts. Because they know money is insured up until a certain amount. And even if they don't have that much money, they're still thinking, if that bank closes, I still have this bank. So when my father passed five years ago, November 12th, he had banks everywhere. It was like, where else does dad have money? And then none of them were like big accounts, but they were all just separate accounts because it gave this sense of security. Now, I'm not blaming him or anything. I'm not making fun of him. But that is kind of what's going on here. You don't want to take a chance and, you know, have it go wrong. And so you, you just keep your, your uh, feelers out just to make sure things are going to go okay. And so this is a systematic destruction on Isaiah's part to say, so we've eliminated the Philistines. Oh, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking Moab. Let's talk about Moab for a moment and see how that works out. And so that is the foundation for everything he is saying here. Now, when we look at Moab, um, you must understand a few other little things. Was there a time that Moab was part of Israel? Interesting question. And I'm going to answer that for you. The answer is yes. During Solomon's reign and during David's reign, Moab was a vassal state of Israel. In other words, they were part of Israel's empire. When Israel was at its peak during Solomon, all these little countries around them were paying tribute, which means they were under the thumb of Israel or part of Israel's uh, uh, empire. Case in point, the year is 1956. Is Poland a free nation? 1956. Whose thumb under they on, are they under? Soviet Union, same with Czechoslovakia, same with Hungary, same with Yugoslavia. They're all under the throne. Estonia, Lithuania, uh, Georgia, you know, you name it, they're all under the control of the Soviet Union. So they may like to have some of their own little traditions, but they're all under that control. So I keep this in mind, when you have that, there is cross-marriage, 
people hanging out with each other, trading with each other, which is one of the reasons why Isaiah feels sympathy for Moab. Because this people, at, at one point, they shared a commonality. And, and now that's no more. And so, in our uh, passage tonight, we're going to see that emerge. So, if we can go to the chapter 16, and we are going to start at verse 1, which is continuing the Moab prophecy. But the reason why they put a, a, a chapter here is because it's changing its tone a little bit. In chapter 16, in these first five verses, what we have is a description of envoys from Moab coming to Judah. In other words, Moab, this is a prophecy. This is what's going to happen to Moab. Moab's going to be in a tough place. Assyria is coming. What are they going to do? How are they going to survive? They have a choice. Who are they going to lean on? One of their choices is to lean on Edom, which is right below them. I'll show you the map again. There's Edom. That's the yellow. They could try to go to Edom, or they could go... The, this, by the way, is the Dead Sea. One of the things you don't know, but if you go to Israel today, there is only land over here, and this you can walk across. It's very shallow, this section here. And at those times, even in the ancient world, there were sections and times where you could walk right across the Dead Sea, over here. This section is super deep. I mean, we're talking the lowest place on the face of the earth. So this section is now one enclosed lake, all salt, and this section here is mostly just like salt marshes, uh, is what it is. But they have a choice. Do I go across here to the kingdom of Judah? Do I go to Edom to try to survive? That's the question at hand. So, dropping into the text, these envoys are, are present, and it says this. Send lambs as a tribute to the ruler of the land. From Selah, across the desert, to the mount of, the, of daughter Zion. Like fluttering birds pushed from the nest, so are the women of Moab at the fords of Arnon. Make up your mind, Moab says. Render a decision. Make your shadow a shadow like night at high noon. Hide the fugitives. Do not betray the refugees. Let the Moabite captives stay with you to be their shelter from the destroyer. Now I'm going to stop there for one moment. Here's the question. It's kind of a cool question from our perspective. Moab has to decide, what are we going to do? Now, when they were under the control of Israel, which God was in supremacy for them? Yahweh the Lord. And so there are people there who think that's the God we want to follow. That's the God we want to hang on to. But there are others there that were pagan. And they're thinking maybe we should go to Edom. Because Edom has the best fortress in the world, in their world. And you can't see it in this text very clearly because it's hidden in the words. So I want to show you a passage from 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 7. And I'm actually using the message paraphrase because it actually translates it correctly. Everyone else just puts the name transliterated, but the message actually says what the name means. And it says here, Amaziah roundly defeated Edom in the Valley of Salt to the tune of 10,000 dead. In another battle, he took, and here it is, the rock and renamed it Jachiel, the name it still bears. Now, what is he talking about? How many of you have ever been to Jordan? Raise your hand. Anyone? <coughs> been to Jordan? Where'd you go? Went to Petra. You went to Petra. That is exactly what I want you to see. 
So what is the rock? We are pretty convinced that the rock is Petra. So I'm gonna show you some pictures of Petra. This is the most famous uh, picture. Um, it, it, it's basically this little sliver of uh, ca canyon that you walk through and when you get through, you see this building, which is the treasury, that's what it's called. And I'm gonna show you some other pictures. That's the treasury again. Um, if you ever saw Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, this is where the grail is kept. Um, but they use this building. These are actually cemeteries. All these, are, they're big graves is what it is. They're, they're hewn out of the rock. And here's, here's another part of it. Um, the, again, big cemeteries. I climbed all over these things. I am, I am like a boy, a little kid. Um, I've been to Petra twice, and uh, whenever I'm there, I climb uh, to the top of things. But what I'm wanting you to see in these photos is that that's, that's the end of that. What, what they are is the opportunity to be the most defensible place against an army. You saw that entrance. It is so narrow. You could keep an army of thousands at bay because they can't get to you behind this huge uh, mountain range. And so that is the rock. By the way, Petra, what does that mean? Rock. It means rock. So let's look at the, the picture again on the map. And you can see it right here on the bottom of Edom, Petra. So that gives you where this is. So here's their thought. Shall we go to indefensible Judah or should we go to the rock? And I don't mean God. I mean this very secure fortress. Should we go and seek protection of the pagans, Edom, or should we go to Yahweh for our help? This question is still here today. What are you going to do? Who are you going to call? Ghostbusters. <laughs> you know, it's, the, it's what are they going to do? How are they going to get by? So that's the question at hand. So verse 3, make up your mind, Moab says. Render a decision. Make your shadow like night at high noon. Hide the fugitives. Do not betray the refugees. So the idea is that Assyria is coming down. They in turn are going down, running away from them. Do I turn right and go into Israel? Or do I go straight down and try to hide in the rock? And what's it going to be? Now this is very interesting because out of this, the Moabite people are speaking. The envoys have their own prophecy. And here it is. Look at verse 4. Uh, let me move up on the screen here because this is worth seeing. In fact, I think I have this preserved up here. I do. Uh, well, I'll read right before him. This is verse 4. The oppressor will come to an end. His destruction will cease. And now comes this amazing prophecy from Moab of all places. In love, a throne will be established. In faithfulness, a man will sit on it. One from the house of David. One who in judging seeks justice and speeds the cause of righteousness. Now, I want to ask you the question. Who does that sound like? Sounds like Jesus. Sounds like Messiah. And the evidence is that somebody from the house of David. So in their journey of having been part of Israel's empire, there was apparently a root of knowledge that said, you know what, when it comes to should we go down to Edom or whether we should go to Judah, it is in Judah that the righteous one will come. It is from Judah that this person who is known for his love shall come. This is your jewel for tonight, this particular verse. I have um, discussions with people fairly regularly about, is the Bible trustworthy? 
most recently with my daughter Tabitha. Um, it was two weeks ago. We had a good conversation in her bedroom. She was just home from college for the weekend. And so we talked about, and she said, Dad, I, I'm just not sure I believe everything I see in the Bible. And she gave some reasons and explanations. And I, I, I said, you know, the, the one thing that is unwise to do as a parent is to, like, quash your child's view. Just let them talk. You know, hear what they have to say. And then acknowledge that there are some things that are hard to understand. I get that. You know, there are some things. But what I come down to, and I've used this frequently, is, uh, and I love the way John Piper puts it in his book, Seeing and Savoring Jesus. He says, seeing Jesus is like seeing the sunrise and knowing it's light and not dark. Seeing Jesus is like tasting honey and knowing that it's sweet and not bitter. There is a self-authenticating validity to him. And so when I say to my child, or I'll say to somebody who I'm just trying to witness to, I know there are questions that you don't get. I don't get all. There are some questions I like to say I put it on the shelf until I get the glory. I don't quite know the answer to that one, but you know what? Having tasted of Jesus, I'm pretty good because he is so sweet. He is so right, so good. If he's okay with the Old Testament, I'm okay with the Old Testament. If he's okay with this, I'm okay with this. And I come running to that point, and I think that's reflected in this verse. In this simple verse given by the Moabite, probably the envoys, in love a throne will be established. In faithfulness, a man will sit on it from the house of David who seeks justice and speeds the cause of righteousness. Those four qualities, love, faithfulness, justice, righteousness, I want them. I want them. And so, you know, to my daughter, I would say, you know, I don't quite understand every, every aspect of Leviticus, you know, of, of some of the uh, verses in Joshua. But I tell you, I've seen Jesus, and I see love, I see faithfulness, I see justice, I see righteousness. I kind of trust them. I trust them. And you know what? I understand Isaiah is going to tell us a few chapters from now, well, a while from now, Isaiah 55. My thoughts are not your thoughts. As high as the heavens are from the earth are my thoughts above your thoughts, says the Lord God Almighty. I don't expect my finite mind gets to figure everything out. It just doesn't. But I do find that I have enough revelation in Jesus to say I, I trust him. I trust him. And, and, I, and I'm good. So this to me is our little ruby, our jewel to hold on tonight. But we have had a problem all through the book of Isaiah, I would argue all through the Bible, of a trait that we have as humans that just shows its ugly head regularly. What is that trait? Pride. Pride. Here's the next verse. We have heard of Moab's pride. How great is her arrogance of her conceit, her pride and her insolence, but her boasts are empty. Therefore, the Moabites wail. Here, once again, is this theme that has repeated itself over and over and over again. Pride. Pride. You have to be so careful with pride. And um, if you're finding yourself slipping into pride, it's time to be ashamed. Because that is not what we are to be. And so, let's continue this next section. So, I didn't tell you this, um, but verse 1 of 16, up until the end of verse 4, actually verse 4a, first part of the verse, is the question, should we go to Judah? Should we go to Judah? Or should we go to Edom? So that's what that section is. 
then comes the lament. The lament, I would actually argue, starts in verse 6, but you could push it to verse 5. And this lament will take us to the end of verse 12. So somebody give me a definition of lament. Sorrow. Sorrow, yeah. Your favorite TV show has been canceled. <laughs> Actually, that'd be pretty lame kind of lament. Usually <laughs> lament is something very, very serious. And in this case, of course, it's the destruction of a country. So we read, We have heard Moab's pride. How great is her arrogance of her conceit, her pride, her insolence. But her boasts are empty. Therefore, the Moabites wail. They wail together for Moab, lament and grieve. Excuse me. Therefore, the Moabites wail. They wail together for Moab, lament and grieve. For the resin cakes of Ker Harish. Now, what we're going to get now is a ton of names. And all these are is to say from this part of the land to the other part of the land. So if you're saying that, you know, the United States is in a bad way, you'd say from New York to California. Um, those are the kinds of things. That's what he's now saying. The fields of Heshbon wither, the vines of Simma also, the rulers of the nations have trampled down the choicest vines which once reached uh, Jazer uh, and spread towards the desert. Their shoots spread out and went as far as the sea. So I weep as Jezer weeps for the vines of Simma, of Hezbon, of Elea. I drench you with tears, the shouts of joy over your ripened fruit and over your harvest have been stilled. Joy and gladness are taken from the orchards. No one sings or shouts in the vineyards. No one treads out the wine in the presses. For I have put an end to the shouting. My heart laments for Moab like a harp. My inmost being for Ker Harish. Uh, Harish. When Moab appears at her high place, she only wears herself out. When she goes to her shrine to pray, it is to no avail. So a couple things I want you to see in this. As I mentioned, we're getting a tour of uh, Moab in this but in this picture here uh, where you see Moab again we have already had the Armon River and then we have the Zered Brook so that's the Zered Brook and here is the Armon River uh, by the way if you actually see these things they're creeks we think river we think the Hudson we think the Mississippi these are creeks very dry area and when you read a phrase like brook that means most of the time there's no water here at all. You know, that, that means that this is just a, like a wild, a dry riverbed. But in, in any case, those are the boundaries of all the places that are in between that are being uh, talked about. But here's some things that I want to draw your attention to. Verse 9, we read, So I weep. Who's I? Isaiah. Isaiah. Once again, he's weeping for Moab. His heart breaks uh, for this people. And which, which tells us a little bit about Isaiah's character here. You know, this is just not prophecies he gives. He has a, a wound that he, he gives. Jeremiah gives us a beautiful picture of the prophet's heart. In, in Jeremiah chapter 20, he has a very honest prayer with God. He says, Lord, you deceived me, and I was deceived. This is Jeremiah praying to God. He's saying, you deceived me, and I was deceived. All day long, all you ever give me to preach is doom and gloom, and I've had it up to here. And he, he's grumpy about it. By the way, he says this prayer after he's being pulled out of a cistern that he was thrown into by the Israel king, you know. He's not a happy camper. But then he says a verse that many pastors have memorized. It is, But if I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. 
Now, on the positive note, pastors like to say, you know, my sermon today is like a fire. I have to release it. But when Jeremiah was talking, it's not like an upbeat, positive thing. It's consuming me. You're giving me this awful message to preach. And I don't like it. But I can't help but do it. And that's what Isaiah is doing right now. It's breaking his heart to tell the people of Moab what their future is going to be like. And where he continues the sadness, verse 11, my heart laments for Moab like a harp in my inmost being. And now comes the reason why this lament is so deep. Look at verse 12. When Moab appears at her high place, what is a high place? It's a shrine to worship your gods. In other words, it's not worshiping the God Yahweh, which you know of. You are under the rule of David. You are under the rule of Solomon. You know there is only one God, the creator of heaven and earth. But instead, you're choosing your little pagan gods. And when she goes to her shrine to pray, it is to no avail. You know, in, in my conversation with uh, my daughter last week, and, and college students have a lot of fair questions. I mean, they're good questions. What, what my attitude with her was, and I'm just hoping it's just a voice, I said, Tabitha, it all comes down to what worldview do you hold to? Because if you hold to a worldview of agnosticism, let's say, it says you're basically, you're, you're affirming Darwinian thought, that it's the survival of the fittest, might makes right, which means every time you're working through New York City and see a homeless person, don't help them. They're just doing what Darwinism says happens. The, the weak fail and they'll die and the healthy will press on and become better. And eventually you'll die and you'll be food for worms. How inspiring. <laughs> now there's another worldview. The worldview that says, no, you are created by God who knit you together in your mother's womb, and that you have a purpose. Every day in your life, according to Psalm 139, is written in this book before any of them come to be. And here's what secular sociologists say, that people of faith live longer, they tend to be happier, and their marriages tend to last longer. And when you die, you'll be with him in glory. Now that's a worldview. Do I have a litmus test to prove it to you through a test tube? I don't. However, when I compare both worldviews, hmm, food for worms, forever with God and glory. Better life here, crappy life here, with no hope. Hmm, it's real hard, you know, trying to wrestle with this. I would lean by faith, not that I know all the answers, but I would lean in this particular direction, because it sure looks like a better life than the other one. And you know what the other part of the worldview is? We care for the poor. We care for the broken. We care for, you know, the, the downtrodden. Because we're commanded to. We're told to. Another part of liking my worldview better than your worldview. And so what I'm trying to do, I, I feel like I'm, pre I'm teaching Isaiah at night. But with my kids, I'm doing the same thing. I'm teaching Isaiah, who are you going to choose? Who are you going to choose? You know, God? You know, Darwinism? You know, that kind of thing. Um, and by the way, it's not just my, my Tabitha. Yesterday it was with Aaron, who's kind of like neutral. He's just like neutral. So I said, uh, you were off today. Missed you at church. Oh, yeah, I was, I was going to go. Um, now, he's not belligerent in any way, you know, about it, but just not a high priority. I said, well, I missed you. I think it would be good for you to go. You know, so I, just a little nudge, a little nudge, you know, as to what can be. By the way, I, I do this on my soapbox all the time. If you have any financial tentacles with your kids, it's nothing wrong with saying there's a, these, this, this purse that you're attached to comes with a few tentacles. You need to go to church. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that in my personal view. And so like my daughter, Tabitha, she has to go to church on Sunday. You know, Hillsong or something in the city. It's part of the deal. I'm paying for her college. You go to church. <laughs> it's, so don't feel... Like you cannot exert a little bit of influence in your kids' lives. I know people have you know, some timidity with this, and I wouldn't be heavy-handed, but it's just fair. I mean, the bank has tentacles. 
Why shouldn't we? You know, in terms of what they're... I digress. <laughs> but the message of Isaiah is so applicable in our own lives. Who are you going to choose? What are you going to choose? So unfortunately, Moab chooses her high places, her pagan gods, which ends with verse 12, to no avail. And now comes this last summation section, verse 13 and 14. And we could title the section, Time of Destruction. This is the word of the Lord, as already spoken concerning Moab. So this is the word of Yahweh. So he's raising the bar here. But now Yahweh says, within three years, as a servant bound by contract would count them, Moab's splendor and all her many people will be despised and her survivors will be very few and feeble. So that's the sad end. Yahweh has spoken. Yahweh has declared. It's going to happen in three years. Moab will be no more. Except, a little bit of hope here. Very few and feeble, but not totally gone. Not totally gone. All right, so that finishes our prophecy of Moab. We are going around Judah and looking at all the places that Israel could choose to find their comfort, their strength, their hope. We're going right around the clock. Now comes this. It says here, the prophecy against Damascus. The prophecy against Damascus. Now, um, this is kind of a, a challenging section of interpretation for a couple reasons. One is Damascus is mentioned. Now, which country is Damascus in? Syria in the modern world. Amman in the ancient world. So let me show you this on the map. Uh, Aram, excuse me, not Amman, Aram. So it's up here, then what do you call that, color teal or something? Um, right here, there's Damascus up on the top. And this is now um, a prophecy, and here's why it's a little hard to interpret. Because while it says a prophecy against Damascus, it also is applying to northern Israel. And so scholars have wondered, why is it listed, a prophecy against Damascus, but it includes northern Israel and what's going on? It's because northern Israel aligned herself with Damascus, with the kingdom of Aram. And so with that in mind, this oracle kind of covers all those who have put their, their uh, uh, investment in this pagan country of Aram. And so that's where the prophecy is. And so it starts off with uh, these words. A prophecy against Damascus. See, Damascus will no longer be a city, but will become a heap of ruins. Now, Damascus will ultimately fall in 732 B.C. 732 B.C. And Samaria, or northern Israel, will fall 10 years later in 722 B.C. So I'm telling you this just so you have a, a framework as to what's happening here, because why do this? Now, Damascus is not, it, this, this language of will be a heap of ruins, it's referring to the fact that the city will no longer be an independent city. It will actually be used by the Assyrians for their purposes. It's going to be a city completely taken over where the people have no authority. It's like Paris under Nazism. Yes, there are people there, but the, you talk up to a Parisian in 1943, this is not my city. This is not my city. It's you know something I've never seen before. And that is what is being described here. The cities of Aurora will be deserted and left to flocks which will lie down with no one to make them afraid. The fortified city will disappear from Ephraim. Now, Ephraim 
is a poetic way of describing who. Does anyone remember? Joseph. Well, that, there's a connection there, but it's northern Israel. Northern Israel, all through the book of Isaiah, is frequently called Ephraim. It's to refer to them in a, in a short uh, shorthand. The fortified city will disappear from Ephraim. The royal power from Damascus. Here where you see the two combined. The remnant from of Aram will be like the glory of the Israelites, declares the Lord Almighty. Now that is kind of a confusing passage as to what that means exactly. It could mean that the remnant of Aram, that Aram is also going to be crushed. Aram is the country. Let me go back to the map so you see what I'm talking about here. Aram is that kind of uh, golden looking country right under Aram, Amman. Oh, excuse me. I'm, I'm confusing my countries here. The blue one. And your students. I'm referring back to that TO1 or the, up there. And so it's referring to that destruction. Let me repeat that sentence again. The remnant of Aram will be like the glory of the Israelites, which is saying in sarcasm that there'll be so little left of Aram, it'll match how little is left in Ephraim in terms of the destruction of the area. They're both being decimated. In that day, verse 4. Okay, here we are. Actually, let me roll up here a little bit. Whoops, a little more. Okay. In that day, the glory of Jacob will fade. The fat of his body will waste away. Now, who's Jacob? Israel. Israel, exactly. <laughs> Poetic language, you just keep changing the name to what you're referring to. You know, it's, it's uh, it'd be like writing uh, Betsy Ross's design, and then the next sentence will say, Old Glories, uh, waving. Um, you know, you just keep on, the, the, and then the next line you would say, the stars and stripes. None of them are actually saying the word flag, but you're, you're, you, you're saying poetically what is going on, and that is what's happening. Um, Jacob, will, is, the fat of his body will waste away. What do you think that implies? No food. Your body just eating its, its, its fat, what it has. In my case, I'm in good shape because I can last a little while, you know, in terms of what to eat. It will be as when the reapers harvest the standing grain, gathering the grain in their arms, as when someone gleans a heads of grain... In the valley of Rephaim, yet some gleanings will remain. So, if you could look at a field that has just been harvested, you know, we don't live in a farm country, but if you ever see, like, after the corn harvest and you just see the, the stalks laying around, you said that's what it's going to be like. That's what Israel is going to be like. This is northern Israel. What's going to be? But here comes the statement of hope. Yet, some gleanings will remain. As when an olive tree is beaten, leaving two or three olives at the topmost branches, five, uh, four or five on its fruitful boughs. I have a, uh, a, a niece who married a walnut farmer in California. And, uh, you know, I, I knew nothing about walnut farming, you know, before this marriage. Do you know how you get walnuts? Uh, off, a, off a tree. That's it. They connect these machines to the tree and it goes and it shakes the walnuts from the tree. And that's how they harvest their walnuts. They're in now uh, walnut season in terms of harvesting. And um, that's exactly here, except they don't have a machine to do it. But that's how you get the, you know, the olives off. But just like there's a few that hang on, so there'll be a remnant. Um, and then it goes on, declares the Lord, the God of Israel. Verse 7. In that day, people will look to their maker and turn their eyes to the Holy One of Israel. Okay, hope 
that's good news. What is a phrase here that shows up uniquely in Isaiah? Only one of Israel. Only one of Israel. Good. You guys are still on your game there. Verse 8. They will not look to the altars, the work of their hands, and they will have no regard for the Asherah poles and their incense altars their fingers have made. Now, in this little sentence, it's saying what Israel was doing before destruction came and how a day is coming when they will not do that anymore. So today, when I asked the staff to go over their testimonies, uh, Pastor Frank went hog wild. I mean, he spoke for 20 minutes giving his testimony. He gave us the long version of his testimony. I kept looking at my watch. I'm like, okay, Frank. Okay, get to the part where you're saved. <laughs> you know. But what was interesting, he actually, it was like he had must have like given us testimony recently because he said this. He says, the book of Deuteronomy says, remember well where you came from. And he said, so I have chosen to remember well where it came from. And what he said, you know, he said he grew up in a, uh, Williamsburg, Brooklyn, when it was a very poor area, very Puerto Rican area, and uh, African American. And he grew up Catholic. He was an altar boy. I, I, you know, I was learning things I did not know. And he, back in the day of the Latin Mass, and he said, we had no clue what the priest was saying. He said, I would ring my bell at the wrong time. <laughs> you know, like he'd ring his bell and the priest goes, <laughs> Mr. O'Neill, stop that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, but then he uh, got into high school. All his friends are starting to get into bad stuff. But he was deathly afraid that God would smite him. So he didn't want to do any of that bad stuff. But then... As he reaches graduation, he's noticing that God's not smiting his friends. They're actually having a good time. And they're, they're actually, you know, doing all the bad stuff, and they look pretty happy to me. So he makes the choice, I'm going with them. And, he's, and, and then, it was very moving, because he then started breaking down into tears. And he, he was saying, I am so sorry for the, the hurt I caused. In particular, he says, different girls that he was with. He says, I, I hurt people. I hurt people. And then he got into selling drugs. Um, he says, I never got into heroin because that looked like death. He said, but I, I got into the lighter stuff and, you know, drinking and all that kind of stuff. And then he reached a point where he knew this is going nowhere. You know, for a while, he says, I was John Travolta, you know, the during the... Uh, Saturday Night Fever kind of thing. You might have bumped into a barber at that point, you know. But he was, he was into the clothing. He got a job. He had his own apartment. He's working for a bank. <coughs> so he's making money. <coughs> All the stuff is going well. But it feels so empty. So he goes to this... Uh, some of you are from a Spanish background. Santeria? Is that? Santeria. Uh, Santeria. There are these stores that you can buy like Candles, witchcraft kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, Candles, yeah, but they also had a Bible. So they had a big white Bible and he bought it, King James, and he thought, I need to read. So he starts reading the beginning, so-and-so begot so-and-so. So it's in you know, like, this doesn't make any sense to me at all. So he then goes to his priest. He goes back, he hadn't been in church in years, but he goes back, priest recognizes him, and he says, I, I want to get right with God. And the priest taps him on the shoulder and says, good for you, and walks away. Oh, oh. I was like, I guess there's nothing here for me. Nothing here for me. And so he then ends up um, bewildered. And some friend of his said, you know what? You should really become a Jehovah Witness like me. And that friend seemed to have all the answers seemed to have an answer for every possible thing. And it made sense, you know, it was answering all his questions. And then, you know, he said, I was on Wall Street every single day giving out Awake magazines. I was trained to debate anyone. You know, I had my, uh, my game together. And the, the crack came 
four and a half years later when he saw Billy Graham and he said, oh, here's the big guy. I'm going to take him on as he's speaking. I'm going to have my green Bible here and I'm going to take this guy on. And as he spoke, he's like, I, I don't really have anything against that. I don't really know how to respond to that. And then, you know, fast forward, he goes to, at the invitation of a friend to Brooklyn Tabernacle, and on, an, on a fluke, on a Tuesday night, Jim Simbola gave an invitation. He never gives one on Tuesday nights. But he said, the Lord is telling me I need to give an invitation tonight. And that was the night that uh, Frank gave his heart to Christ. But in that story, the reason I'm telling it here is if you ask Frank, do you want to go back to those early days, the Saturday Night Fever days, <laughs> the drinking, the pot, the, you know, the wild living. And, and I see in the tears of his eyes today, no, I don't want to go there. I don't want to return to that. And in this case, it is, you, the time will come when you will not look at the altars to work of your hand, verse 8, and you will have no regard for the Asherah poles. Now, Asherah poles, let's look at them for just a second. Here are some artist conceptions of what we are talking about here. Ah, there we are. So, um, these are created based on the, what we've seen in some ancient findings. In other words, these are not old ancient Asherahs. These are what we can pick up from the artwork and some may have been recreated as to what they look like. Now, what is prevalent in everything you're seeing here? Bosoms. Right, you got it. You got it, press. Asherah is a fertility god, is a fertility god. And so all of them have sexual attributes that relate to that. Now, how do you worship a fertility god? Fertility god. Through sexuality through temple prostitutes, through immorality. And so the idea, this is, this is the concept, that this goddess will send rain, if you could think of rain, I, you know, speaking crudely, as seed from the sky into the womb of the earth, producing crops. In other words, you want it to rain, so you get food to eat. And so the Canaanite land was filled with these things. And so it's saying the day is coming when you're not going to use these Asherah poles anymore. Now, what happens if you have lots of unprotected sex? Unexpected or unplanned pregnancies. What do you do with unwanted babies? In their world, you bring them to Molech. Molech is, a, is an iron god with arms like this, and you place, they heat up Molech in an oven or in fire, and you place your unwanted child in the arms of burning Molech. And that would be the way you worship Molech. And so the, if you ever read through the Bible, you'll see this phrase, you caused your children to pass through the fire and the irony is we do this in our own culture does our culture worship sex mm -hmm. absolutely and what do we do with unwanted children we pass them through a saline solution of you know abortion and we we do this in the same thing we we do we're doing the same thing but here is the hope the day is coming when you won't do that the day is coming when you'll see the folly of your ways and you will not pursue that anymore. And so that is, I just wanted to give you this image. So when you hear this phrase in the Bible, Asherah poles, that's what it is. It looks something like this. And people would put them on high places. And so that's where that uh, phrase, high places. It's just viewed as, you know, the high places are where you worship. By the way, if you ever go to Petra, um, if you climb up to the highest places, you will see where they had their sacrifices. And the evidence is they were human sacrifices at the high places in Petra, and they actually have these stone troughs 
which would gather the blood from the sacrifices and uh, fill them in these little pools. It's horrible looking. I mean, you could walk by it and not know what you're seeing, but once it's described to you, you realize this is horrible. And they are at the highest places in Petra where they would use these uh, human sacrifices. So he's saying the day is coming where you're going to put these things aside. Verse 9, in that day, their strong cities, which they left because of the Israelites, will be like places abandoned to thickets and undergrowth. They will all be desolation. And now here's what they've given up. Verse 10, you have forgotten God, your Savior. You have not remembered the rock, your fortress. I love the description of what they've given up because it's very powerful. It's like, do you want to give that up? You know, right now, they're gearing a word. The day will come when you'll get it right. But right now, you're not getting it right. You've forgotten God, your Savior, and, re and not remembered your rock, your fortress. Therefore, though you set out the finest plants and plant imported vines, verse 11, Though on the day you set them out, you make them grow. And on the morning when you plant them, you bring them to bud. Yet the harvest will be as nothing. In the day of disease and incurable pain, woe to the many nations that rage. Now, verse 12 begins a general appeal to all the nations. So this applies to the United States as much as it does to them. Woe to the many nations that rage. They rage like the raging sea. Woe to the peoples who roar. They roar like the roaring great waters. Although the peoples roar like the roar of surging waters, when he rebukes them, they flee far away, driven before the wind like chaff, chaff on the hills, like tumbleweed before a gale. In the evening, sudden terror. Before the morning, they are gone. This is the portion of those who loot us, the lot of those who plunder us. That last statement is once again this statement. What are you going to choose? Every nation I've told you about, Isaiah says, comes to ruin. Who do you want to depend on? Judah? Are you going to look to your northern neighbor, Israel? They're like Damascus. They're going to fall. Are you going to look to Aram? Not going to succeed. You're going to look to Moab? Moab's not going to be there. You're going to look to the Philistines? Forget that. You're going to look to Assyria? No. Babylon? No. We're going to get to Egypt. We haven't gotten there yet, but we're going to get to Egypt. In all and through all, we have this great hope. And I want to just bring it and end with this section. In love a throne will be established. In faithfulness, a man will sit on it. One from the house of David, one in judging seeks justice and speeds the cause of righteousness. That's where I'm putting my money. That's where the appeal is. Seek God and his Messiah. Well, we're ending a few minutes early. All right, so let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for the privilege we've had to go through difficult chapters, 16 and 17. They're dark, but in the midst of these chapters, there is a picture of your son. In the midst of these chapters, there is a view of a day that is coming when we will not pursue the junk that we pursued once before. Father, we began by praying for our children. We end praying that we ourselves would remember these truths, that our hope would be found in a Messiah named Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for coming. And although next week is Thanksgiving week, we're still here.